great. Well, good morning and thank you all so much for joining us for uh, this morning's presentation. Uh, we're going to be learning about Sacco and Vanzetti. Were they murderers or martyrs? Accused of a 1920 South Braintree robbery during which, which two men were murdered in cold blood, uh, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti were convicted and sentenced to, to death. Uh, but did evidence support their convictions beyond a reasonable doubt, or were they convicted simply because they were Italian immigrants and anarchists? Uh, the Sacco and Vanzetti case became an international cause celebre, um, uh, uh, igniting massive demonstrations, uh, splitting families apart, and to some, staining Massachusetts justice forever. Uh, this morning's presentation is led by Gregory Williams, who was a district court judge for many years, retiring as the first justice of the Edgartown District Court uh, on the Cape back in 2015. And again, I wanna thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library, as well as the Medford and Rockport Libraries for supporting this morning's program. Uh, so all 40 of us that are watching live on Zoom and those that will watch the recording, la recording later on, uh, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Gregory for joining us this morning and Gregory, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Robert. And I'd also like to thank the Tewksbury Public Library and the friends of the Tewksbury Public Library for uh, inviting me to come back to uh, you virtually and speak about another topic. This one is Sacco and Vanzetti. Let's, uh, let's start with a quote. Now there came multitudes of men of the lowest class from the south of Italy ranks where there was neither skill, nor energy, nor any initiative of quick intelligence. And they came in numbers which increased from year to year, as if the countries of the south of Europe were disburdening themselves of the more sordid and hapless elements of their population. That is a quote from A History of the American People by Woodrow Wilson, not yet president. In 1908, 129,000 immigrants arrived in the United States from Italy. Among them were 17-year-old Nicola Sacco and 20-year-old Bartolomeo Vanzetti. They did not know each other. Sacco was from Torre Maggiore in Puglia. Vanzetti was from Villa Folletto in the northern Piedmont, some 540 miles away. Uh, they were uh, not from the lowest classes of Italian citizenry, but they were both from stable families, uh, actually fairly well-to-do uh, landowners and uh, agricultural uh, producers. They did not come to the United States out of economic desperation. They did not come here because of some kind of revolutionary fervor but they came to secure their own independence and uh, at least in Vanzetti's case to escape his grief over his mother's death. Now, luckily uh, immigration into the United States uh, hasn't been an issue for us for decades. You just don't hear about immigration anymore. But then native, nativist prejudice in the United States against uh, a lot of different national groups, but specifically here Italians had run deep since the first wave of Italian immigration, which began about in the 1880s. Uh, a lot of Italians were considered criminals. They were considered anarchists or worse. Uh, plus they were, they were Catholic, they talked funny and they ate weird food that's never caught on in this country generally. Now it's true that among those immigrants, there were some adherence to anarchism. The concept of anarchism can seem sort of frustratingly vague and amorphous. Abolish government, abolish law, abolish private property, and people will become free. It's uh, kind of a faith in people's instincts toward cooperation, and cooperation would replace, without governmental structure, uh, the instinct uh, and capitalist structure, the instincts of uh, destructive competition. So again, it's kind of an impractical faith in the goodness of oppressed workers, born of the perception that uh, unbridled industry, unbridled capitalism had divided Western societies into quite rich 
and very poor. Uh, luckily, again, uh, this topic, income disparity, relegated to dusty history books, not a concern in the country anymore. But in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, anarchism both fueled and was fueled by frequent violent clashes uh, between management and labor, such as the Haymarket Affair in Chicago in 1886 and the Bread and Roses textile strike in Lawrence in 1912. Many anarchists did not advocate violent change, but some did. One notable proponent of what was called propaganda by the deed, which essentially means violence, uh, was Luigi Galliani. He lived for a while in Rentham. His published works included the, the periodical Chronica Soversia, Chronicle of Subversion, and he also did a 46 page manual called Health is in You. That was a bomb making manual. Among Galliani's followers were Sacco and Vanzetti. In 1917, Sacco and Vanzetti met each other for the first time. They were among a group of anarchists who traveled to Mexico, uh, mostly to avoid the military draft, but also as kind of a launch pad to be ready to leave for Italy once the global workers' revolution, as they saw it, that Lenin had launched in Russia, spread to Western Europe. But uh, eventually that group dispersed and Sacco and Vanzetti both came back to Massachusetts. Upon returning here, Sacco uh, who had worked in shoe factories before, ended up becoming an expert shoe edge trimmer, which was quite a skilled craft. Uh, as probably all of you or many of you know, the industry of shoemaking was uh, very prevalent here in Massachusetts for years. And by 1920, Sacco and his family lived in Stoughton. This is a picture of Sacco, his wife, Rosina, and his son, Dante. Uh, Vanzetti was unmarried. He was a fish peddler by that time. He had done a lot of different jobs all over the place, many places in Massachusetts. But by 1920, he was a fish peddler in Plymouth and lived in a mostly Italian section in North Plymouth. On April 15th, 1920, at about three o'clock in the afternoon on Pearl Street in South Braintree, Two men were walking the few hundred yards from one building of the Slater and Morrill Shoe Company to another of its buildings. They were 45-year-old assistant paymaster Frederick Parmenter, uh, who had worked for uh, Slater and Morrill for about 20 years, and a 44-year-old security guard named Alessandro Birardelli. Uh, he had only begun work at Slater the previous fall. Each of these men was married, each had two children. They carried steel boxes, which contained the cash pay packets for the workers down at the, down at the main factory, uh, totaling, depending on your source, $15,748.91, or $15,776.56. Uh, how much money is that now? Well, historical, money conversions are notoriously uh, complicated, difficult, and uncertain, but certainly considerably more than $200,000. Uh, these two men might or might not have been armed. If they were armed, it would have been Beer or Delhi. He was the armed guard. The story of what happened next, uh, as with nearly any dramatic event, varies considerably depending upon which witnesses you want to give credit to. Uh, this is Pearl Street around the time of this incident in 1920. And generally what happened, probably a better view there, is Parmenter and Berardelli walked down Pearl Street, which as you can see, isn't even paved. Uh, and they walked by two men who were lounging on this pipe fence 
in front of the Rice and Hutchins building. That was another shoe manufacturer. So they were going from one Slater facility to the other past the Rice facility. Just as they passed uh, these two uh, loiterers in front of this building, uh, one of them pulled a pistol and shot both Parmenter and Berardelli. Parmenter tried to run across the road. Uh, there were some laborers there. You can see that water tower uh, right over here. Out of the frame was a foundation being dug for a restaurant, number of, of laborers over there. Uh, but uh, Parmenter in trying to get across the roadway was shot twice. Birardelli fell immediately here in the roadway and a gunman stood over his crouched body and pumped three more bullets into him. Now, having been signaled a uh, large car looking something like that with three men drove up, the cash boxes were thrown into the vehicle, the two bandits jumped in and the car tore away to the extent that cars in 1920 could tear away. And this whole incident was over in less than one minute. Birard Deli, uh, lying there on the roadway, died immediately. One of the bullets had severed his aorta. Parmenter lived long enough to mumble some incoherent words to the police, but he died the following morning. When they heard about this crime, police in New Bedford and also in Providence immediately quickly assumed the perpetrators of the crimes. Uh, and that was the Morellis or the Morelli gang of Providence. This was a gang that sort of specialized in targeting shoe manufacturers, both to steal shoes and to steal money. Uh, and in fact, several of those gang members were under indictment on that day at that time um, for thefts from Slater and from Rice. So to those police departments, New Bedford, Providence, it was obvious this was the Morellis. But much of the law enforcement community uh, were focused on, if not obsessed by, foreign radicals, Bolsheviks, anarchists. And these people were all socialists. Uh, they were all lumped together as reds. Extreme jingoism had flourished in the United States since the United States had finally entered World War I in March of 1917. And the press, not surprisingly, stirred this kind of hysteria. Uh, not that there was no basis for concern. One year before the Braintree murders uh, in April 1919, authorities uncovered a plot to mail 36 bombs to various pillars of American uh, economic and political establishment. Eight bombs exploded in eight cities. The only casualty, tragic one nonetheless, was uh, a maid for a Georgia senator handling the package, uh, her, her hands were blown off. A month later, a huge bomb ripped off the front of the Washington DC house of Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer. The Palmers were home, they were, uh, he and his wife, they were miraculously uninjured and they were soon wandering dazedly out in front of their house among all the rubble, which was smoking and on fire, and scattered pink leaflets that were signed the anarchist fighters. Uh, by the way, their neighbor came over to check on them. The neighbor across the street, it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his wife. Um, Palmer kind of took this personally and soon launched what became known as the Palmer Raids, which were part of the first Red Scare. Small armies of federal agents and local police agencies would storm communist, uh, anarchist, Russian groups sometimes, but not always. They even bothered to secure warrants before they charged in somewhere. But despite thousands of arrests, uh, there was scant evidence of a widespread or, or national conspiracy. Nevertheless, uh, anybody who might fall under that umbrella of being a radical was terrified. The following month, February 1920, 
the Department of Justice, who were acting on a tip regarding the source of those anarchist flyers that had fluttered around the front of Palmer's house after it was bombed, uh, sequestered two men in their New York offices. And they kept them there for months. Some Boston area anarchists, including the uh, group with Sacco and Van Zay, uh, wanted to learn the status of uh, these two men. So Vanzetti was chosen to go down to New York. Uh, he le only learned down there that the heat was on. Uh, there were gonna be more raids. Uh, obviously the big evidence of your being an anarchist was your possession of a lot of anarchist literature. That was going to have to be disposed of. A few days later, after Vanzetti returned back to Massachusetts, um, the broken body of one of those detainees in New York, a gentleman named Salcedo, was found on the sidewalk 14 floors below where he had been sequestered. The press reported that Salcedo had told the Department of Justice that the Gallianisti, the followers of Luigi Galliani in Massachusetts, were behind these bombings. So that only augmented the heat that the radicals felt. So the group up here, uh, Gallianisti, including Sacco and Vanzetti, needed a car to collect this incriminating evidence, uh, this uh, allegiance to the anarchist cause. And again, mostly literature. On May 5th, uh, 1920, four anarchists gathered at Sacco's house in Stoughton. And the four were Sacco, who was then 29 years old, Vanzetti, who was 31, a gentleman named Ricardo Orsiani, and another gentleman named Mario Buda, sometimes called Mike Boda. Uh, Boda owned a somewhat battered uh, car called an Overland that was in manufacture at the time. And he planned to retrieve that car from a West Bridgewater garage. Sacco and Vetti, uh, Vanzetti rode the streetcar there. The police chief in Bridgewater was a gentleman named Michael Stewart. He was, he was virtually the whole police department there. Um, and he was especially obsessed with anarchists, Reds. A few months earlier, Christmas Eve, 1919, uh, we're now in early May, 1920. The murders in Bridgewater had been uh, in April, 1920. Back on Christmas Eve, 1919, in Bridgewater, three men tried to rob a truck that was carrying more than $33,000 in payroll money for, I guess, a shoe company. Uh, there was sort of a, a, a bit of exchange of uh, gunfire, one of the would-be bandits had a shotgun, fired that. The truck crashed into a pole. The plan came apart and the robbers took off in a car. Stewart, chief of police of that town, Bridgewater, was convinced that this was the work of a gang of Reds and Bolsheviks. Then on the day after the Braintree crimes, April 16th, 1920, federal authorities asked Stewart, Chief Stewart of Bridgewater, to help them in deporting an anarchist named Kowachi. Kowachi lived with Buddha. Uh, the police found Kowachi and uh, given some potentially circum, uh, suspicious circumstances, Stewart decided that Kowachi was one of the Christmas Eve bandits in his town. And further, he thought that Buddha's car, the Overland, uh, had been used to transport bandits to and from a stolen Buick, a Buick that had been stolen in Needham, uh, that police had found in the woods. Uh, they were convinced that this Buick had been used in both crimes, Christmas Eve, 1919, April, uh, 1920. So Buddha's car was in the garage of a man named uh, Simon Johnson. And Stewart had already asked Johnson to call him if anyone came to collect the car. So on the night of May 5th, 
Sacco, Vanzetti, Orsiani, Buddha, came to Johnson's house for the car. Johnson's wife called Stewart. Johnson advised Buddha not to take the car because it did not have current license plates. And Buddha said, fine, uh, I'll send somebody back here. Uh, after we get that straightened out, we'll send somebody back here tomorrow to pick up the car. And they left, all four of them. Buddha and Orsiani uh, left on their motorcycle with a sidecar. And Sacco and Vanzetti took a streetcar to Brockton. Uh, Stewart uh, arrived at Johnson's and all four of them had already gone. He alerted Brockton police about the two who were on the streetcar heading their way to Brockton. But just before 10 o'clock that night, the streetcar stopped on Main Street in Brockton and two police officers boarded the car, Michael Connolly and Earl Vaughn. And they were looking for uh, the two foreigners, or two of the foreigners who tried to quote, steal or take a car in Bridgewater. I don't know where this came from. Stealing, it was, it was Buddha's car. They were with him. Uh, taking, wh what does that mean? Uh, it's not much here, really not much here. It's thin. Connolly sees Sacco and Vanzetti on the streetcar. Vanzetti would later claim that Connolly pointed his service revolver at him and said, you don't move, you dirty thing. Connolly also might have said, keep your hands out on your lap or you'll be sorry. In any event, he told them that they were under arrest and they asked him what for. And the answer was suspicious characters. Police have zero at this point. There is no ground for arrest in my view. Uh, under the law that exists now and has for decades, uh, police had no real reason to seize Sacco and Vanzetti, which is what they've done now at this point. Uh, to effect a seizure now, police now must have reasonable suspicion based on what is called specific and articulable facts that the person that they're stopping is committing, has committed, or is about to commit a crime. Well, where is it here? It's not here. Uh, so presumably what would happen today is lawyers for Sacco and Vanzetti would file a motion to suppress and that would be allowed. Uh, this case would be over. This talk would not be happening. And the dozens and dozens of books, films, and media generally uproar uh, wouldn't have happened. But it was a looser situation in 1920. The police searched them. On Vanzetti, they found a 38 caliber, caliber, sorry, Harrington and Richardson revolver. They also found four shotgun shells. Uh, apparently, Sacco was also searched at the scene, but not very well. At the station, police found on Sacco a 32 caliber Colt automatic with nine rounds and 23 cartridges of varying kinds. Apparently it was not unusual in Southeastern Massachusetts, at least for uh, Italians to go about armed. Uh, the later explanation was that uh, among Sacco's duties at his factory uh, were or was uh, that he was a, a night watchman, which is why he had a pistol. And Vanzetti was a street fish peddler. He felt he needed a pistol. That was the explanation. Connolly, Police officer Connolly would claim at the trial a year later for the first time that on the streetcar, both Sacco and Vanzetti made uh, what would now be called a furtive gesture, made moves as though to draw weapons. In fact, Connolly would testify that Sacco in the police car twice tried to put his hand under his overcoat. So police were so worried uh, about these uh, desperados, these killers who had supposedly gunned down two men in the street in broad daylight without hesitation, that even after they thought Sacco was trying to pull a gun, didn't bother to search him thoroughly until they got him to the police station in Brockton. 
And again, Connolly never testified before the trial that Sacco or Vanzetti had made any kind of threatening movements. Vaughn, the other police officer, never claimed that either one of them had made such moves. Uh, now, in custody, Sacco and Vanzetti were not asked about the Bridgewater murders or the robbery or the attempted uh, uh, robbery in, uh, in uh, sorry, the, the, the Braintree murders or robbery or the Bridgewater attempted robbery. They were asked such questions as, why were you in Bridgewater? Uh, how long have you two known each other? Uh, and most pointedly, uh, are you radicals? Are uh, you members of the International Workers of the World, IWW, Wobblies? Were you anarchists? Were you socialists? Are you communists? Uh, do you believe in the government of the United States? Now, it seems reasonable, given the tenor of these questions, that Sacco and Vanzetti believed that they were being investigated for their anarchists' proclivities and activities. That was the very reason they were out that night. They didn't want to be prosecuted for that. Uh, they didn't want to be deported for that. And they didn't want to fly out of a 14th century window for that. So they lied. They lied to the police. The district attorney showed up a gentleman named Fred Katzman. Uh, they lied to him. They lied about almost everything they were asked. No, they had not been at Johnson's. Uh, they didn't know Mike Buddha. Uh, they weren't anarchists. The police and the DA became convinced, although nobody had talked about either of those two crimes, that they had cracked those cases. Numerous witnesses came to the station and identified Sacco and or Vanzetti, uh, mostly improperly in uh, the most suggestive setting possible. They're in a cell. Uh, no lineups. These were conducted without such procedures as a lineup. Sacco was apparently even made to pose as though he were firing a pistol. Uh, today, identifications, uh, the ones that were kind of sort of made uh, such as they were, they would, I submit to you, be suppressed. And again, the case ends now. Sacco and Vanzetti would stand trial in Dedham for the Braintree murders. But before that trial, as a tactical matter on behalf of the Commonwealth, Katzman elected to try Vanzetti in Plymouth for the Bridgewater attempt, uh, assault with intent to rob, assault with intent to murder. Uh, the theory was that he was the man who fired the shotgun. Uh, the trial began in June of 1920 at the old Plymouth courthouse, which you see here. Um, I was uh, thrilled once to sit there in the courtroom, uh, which is up here, uh, where Vanzetti had been tried. The judge was 64-year-old Webster Thayer of Worcester. Thayer did not like foreigners. He did not like radicals, and he surely did not like anarchists. At Vanzetti's trial, the evidence against him was weak at best. Uh, the identification evidence was mostly almost laughable. Vanzetti's defense was alibi. Uh, Christmas Eve, the, the Italians there in North Plymouth and around the country uh, had a tradition of eating eels. 14 witnesses from North Plymouth testified that Vanzetti had delivered to them from his push cart eels at the time of the Bridgewater crime, before it, after it. They were not believed. They were, after all, Italians who didn't speak English very well. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, now retired from his newspaper reporting days, told me once that he interviewed one of these people in the 1970s, and she still was upset. She cried. They didn't believe us. Vanzetti was convicted. And on August 16th, 1920, Thayer sentenced him 12 to 15 years uh, in state prison. That was considered, even then, an extremely heavy sentence. 
for someone who had no criminal record at all. Uh, less than a month later, in September 1920, Sacco and Vanzetti were indicted for Braintree. Five days after that, September 16th, 1920, a man parked a horse-drawn wagon on Wall Street in New York, the heart of American capitalism, and walked away. The wagon was filled with dynamite and heavy cast iron slugs. And when it exploded at noon, 39 people were killed and nearly 300 were seriously injured. Blood literally ran in the streets of New York. Most severely damaged was, uh, in, in terms of architecture, was the J.P. Morgan and Company, the most powerful private bank in the world. Uh, the bomber was never caught. In fact, uh, it is believed that by November, he was in Italy. Remember Mike Buda? He's your chief suspect. Vanzetti would start the, quote, Sacco Vanzetti trial uh, as a convicted felon. The trial began uh, May 31st, 1921 in Norfolk Superior Court in Dedham. Presiding was Judge Webster Thayer who had requested that he be the trial judge in this case. He having already convicted or presided over the conviction of Vanzetti and Plymouth. It quickly became obvious that he hated Sacco and Vanzetti's lawyer, who was a uh, long haired radical from California named Fred Moore. Uh, a committee called the Sacco and Vanzetti Defense Committee had been formed to advocate for Sacco and Vanzetti and raise money for them. Uh, they had hired Mr. Moore, uh, who had been involved in representing people uh, in connection with the Lawrence textile strike, well known for representing radicals. The trial lasted uh, about six weeks through a punishing heat wave. More than 150 witnesses testified. Now, criminal defendants, as you know, uh, typically sit at counsel table with their lawyers to allow communication with their lawyers. But in capital cases then, defendants sat in a metal enclosure, uh, virtually a cage, or at least a symbolic cage, in front of the judge's bench. This practice was banned in 1963. This is a pretty suggestive symbolism. These people are supposed to be presumed innocent at this point. And here you see uh, Banzetti Sacco Sacco's wife, uh, uh, and I've written, I've written Nicola there. Her name was not that, it was Rosina. So Rosina Sacco. Uh, the first the jury pool consisted of 500 white guys, uh, no women. The first women jurors to ever sit on a, on a trial in Massachusetts sat in 1951 as a result of a statute past the previous year. Uh, the pool was exhausted by day three and Thayer ordered the sheriff, get out there and uh, get me a pool of 200 more men overnight. Uh, among the men grabbed by the, uh, the deputies were, uh, was I should say a newlywed at his wedding dinner. This method of jury selection is clearly unfair and uh, improper. It's not random. The deputies could pretty much pick who they wanted. Uh, and they found 175 men, and soon there was a jury for Sacco and Vanzetti's trial. The foreman of the jury ended up being a 69 year old man named Walter Ripley, who was once the police chief of Quincy. Uh, before the trial, a friend of his also had been summoned for jury trial duty, and he mentioned that he thought Sacco and Vanzetti might be innocent. And Ripley said, damn them, they ought to hang them anyway. Jury foreman. Now, there's been a lot of writing about whether, uh, and discussion about whether Sacco and or Vanzetti were innocent. Uh, that's a moral call, not a legal one. 
at trial, no one is found innocent as opposed to guilty. Uh, either the Commonwealth has proven your guilt at a trial beyond a reasonable doubt, or it is not so proven, in which case you're not guilty, not the same as innocence. So when you read about Sacco and Vanzetti or anybody else and their innocence, that's not the legal conclusion. It's, it's, it's not guilty. The Commonwealth or the state has not proven guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Long trial eyewitness testimony ate much of this trial time. Uh, numerous studies have concluded for decades now that eyewitness testimony is often uh, unreliable, sometimes drastically un un unreliable. A lot of conflicting evidence regarding identifying particularly Sacco. More than 20 witnesses testified that they had seen uh, the bandits or some of the members of that group, and none of them were Sacco or Vanzetti. Uh, one of those witnesses, by the way, was an 18-year-old gentleman named Albert Frantello, who walked by the two uh, loungers in front of Rice, Rice and Hutchins just before the crime. And he really looked at those men. He said neither was Sacco or Vanzetti. He was the last living witness from the trial. He died in the 1980s. And I gave a talk about Sacco and Vanzetti one time here on the Cape, and that gentleman's daughter approached me and gave me some newspaper clippings about her father and uh, his death in the 1980s. Now, as for Vanzetti, you would have thought IDing him might be fairly simple, uh, walrus mustache. No witness really put Vanzetti at the crime scene. Now, my favorite witness, one of the Commonwealth's star witnesses, was a woman named Mary Splane. Uh, she put Sacco in the getaway car. She supposedly saw him for three seconds, tops. She was 80 feet away. She saw him through a second floor factory window. At pretrial hearings, she could not identify Sacco. Uh, but at the trial, she described him. He was slightly taller than she. She gave his weight at 140 to 145 pounds. He was muscular. Quote, she noticed particularly the left hand was a good sized hand, a hand that denoted strength. He wore a gray, grayish or navy colored shirt. He had a clean cut face with a high forehead. He, his hair was brushed back uh, two to two and a half inches long and he had a peculiar white complexion that looked greenish. She uh, had also before trial been convinced that a mugshot that the Massachusetts State Police had shown her, quote, bore a striking resemblance to the man I saw in South Braintree. She was among a number of witnesses who identified that mugshot as being one of the bandits. Uh, the problem was that the mugshot was that of a guy who was incarcerated in Buffalo, New York on the day of the crime, April, 14, uh, April uh, 15th. Both Sacco and Vanzetti had alibis. Uh, Sacco testified that he, that day, had been at the Italian consulate in Boston seeking a passport for his family to travel to Italy following his mother's death, wanted to visit his father. Several witnesses corroborated his movements in Boston. And specifically, the passport clerk, uh, who was in Italy at the time of the trial, testified by deposition that Sacco was there about two o'clock in the afternoon of April 15th. And he remembered that because Sacco brought a very much too large photograph to use as a passport photo. Uh, as for Vanzetti, uh, six witnesses corroborated his testimony. He was selling fish, as usual, in Plymouth. In addition to the eyewitness testimony, there was physical evidence. Uh, most important of the physical evidence was ballistics. Uh, ballistics evidence in the 1920s was in its infancy. Uh, and here, the ballistics evidence, which uh, principally went to Sacco, is 
Byzantine. It's beyond convoluted. Uh, suffice it to say that the Commonwealth focused on what came to be called bullet number three. And that's the bullet that severed Birardelli's aorta. Uh, the testimony as to whether or not it came from the cult that had been found on Sacco was equivocal at best. Uh, and the chain of custody evidence that you need when you put in physical evidence at a trial, obviously, was, was all but non-existent. Uh, since the trial, there has been some suggested su suggestion that bullets were switched. Uh, certainly some evidence that uh, the pistol thereafter, maybe before, had been dissembled and maybe parts changed. Uh, and also the Commonwealth proved contradictorily that no other of the five bullets recovered were from Sacco's Colt. Uh, is that a reasonable doubt? As to Vanzelli, uh, Vanzetti, the Commonwealth really had no evidence that he was even at the crime scene. So they focused on their theory against him, which was that the pistol that was found on him when he was arrested was a revolver that Beer Ardelli might have had. And I guess my reaction to that, and I haven't seen this written anywhere, but uh, it probably is somewhere because there's so much. So what? Uh, the fact that even if it were his gun, uh, or that is, the, even if it were the same gun, even if Sac uh, Vanzetti were proven to have had Biardelli's gun, you've got receiving stolen property, I think, and that's it. Uh, but even here, there's no evidence that Birardelli actually had a pistol on him that day. And no witness testified uh, about seeing anybody removing anything from Birardelli. The only thing that was removed from that street scene was or were the two large cash boxes. Uh, although there was some evidence from the gun store owner uh, in Boston suggesting that the two weapons were the same, years later, that witness described the Commonwealth's pressure on him. Uh, and he thereafter, after the trial, after it was too late, opined that the gun that Vanzetti had was likely not Berardelli's. Then in 1977, some police files were released. Remember Chief Stewart from Bridgewater? He noted that the pistol that Berardelli might have had was a 32 caliber. Vanzetti's was a 38 caliber. Oh, also those two weapons, different serial numbers. Therefore, the Commonwealth might have known that the two pistols were different. They did not disclose that critical evidence, that exculpatory, exculpatory evidence to the defense. Now, another piece of physical evidence was a cloth cap, cap that was found at the scene that the Commonwealth tried to prove was Sacco's cap. Uh, but the cap was found some two days later after the crime. And there had been hundreds and hundreds of people on Pearl Street in the interim. If you look at photographs from the early 20th century of men outside, everybody is wearing a hat or a cap, everyone, all the time. Uh, there was much made about a hole in the back inside of the cap. Supposedly, Sacco had the habit of hanging uh, his cap on a nail that could have made such a hole. After the trial, a police officer finally owned up that he had made that hole himself looking for some kind of name tag in there. The district attorney, Katzman, asked Sacco at the trial to try on the cap that was clearly too small for him. Now, some of us might remember a more recent trial in which the defendant tried on a garment, an item of clothing in open court, which appeared too small for him. And a, rhyme, a rhyming couplet ensued. Here, Fred Moore apparently did not say, if the cap's too tight, the guilty ain't right. Oh, one other piece of evidence you might have expected to hear about. You'll remember my mention of the stolen Buick in the woods that was supposedly used in both of these crimes. That vehicle was dusted for fingerprints. Uh, but then there was apparently a meeting between the Massachusetts State Police and the DA's office. 
of what happened to those fingerprints, what happened to the attempt to obtain fingerprints. Who knows? Nobody, not mentioned. Now, the evidence that Thayer always fell back on in post-trial motions to him for a new trial was what is called consciousness of guilt, which is kind of self-explanatory. That became sort of the key or one of the keys to what it, what it ended up happening to Sacco and Benzetti in his trial, their convictions. Uh, supposedly, they had made uh, threatening gestures, threatening behavior. Uh, they were armed. Uh, they were lying, which they did do. And so consciousness of guilt simply is if you act guilty through some kind of evasion or activity, uh, maybe you are guilty. Maybe it can be considered as uh, evidence of your guilt. The problem here was that if Sacco and Vanzetti did actually act guilty, it could well have been, again, I think I mentioned this earlier, for their anarchistic activities. And that's what they feared they were being arrested for, not for the Bridgewater crime, not for the Braintree crime. The case went to the jury uh, July 14th of 1921. A few days before that, uh, Thayer was at uh, the Worcester Golf Club. And it has been reported pretty credibly, creditably that uh, Thayer at that time referred to Sacco and Vanzetti as those bastards. He said they were Bolsheviki and he would get those guys hanged. Uh, later, Thayer shocked a friend of his at a, a Dartmouth football game. Did you see what I did with those anarchistic bastards the other day? I guess that will hold them for a while. Let them go to the Supreme Court, Supreme Judicial Court, he might have said, and see what they can get from them. No such prejudice uh, really appears in the trial record, except a lot of uh, language uh, that... Uh, Thayer gave to the jury uh, in which he likened the jury to soldiers responding to that call in the spirit of supreme American loyalty. Um, he who is loyal to God, to country, to his state, and to his fellow men uh, represents the highest and noblest type of true American citizenship than which there is none grander in the entire world. Um, Remember who we're talking about here, Sacco and Vanzetti, dodging the draft, Italian immigrants, anarchists. He tempered it somewhat by later saying that Sacco and Vanzetti were entitled to the uh, same rights and consideration as though their forebears had come over to the country in the Mayflower. I was a little less florid. Sacco and Vanzetti were convicted of two counts of first degree murder. Uh, when those verdicts came, Sacco seemed stunned. And then he cried out, they kill two innocent men. Uh, Rosina there in the courtroom screamed. She ran to their cage. She was hysterical before the police were able to pull her away. Uh, there followed seven years of motions for a new trial on numerous grounds, all of them denied by Thayer. There were appeals to the Supreme Judicial Court, the highest court in the Commonwealth. During the appeal process, uh, Fred Moore was replaced by uh, what I guess could be called an establishment lawyer, a gentleman named William Thompson from Boston, highly respected conservative Boston lawyer who eventually came to believe that Sacco and Vanzetti were indeed not guilty. In 1925, a 23-year-old inmate at Dedham Jail, where Sacco was, a guy named Celestino Medeiros. Uh, he was an immigrant from the Azores. He was awaiting decision on his appeal of the murder of a bank teller in Rentham during a robbery. Uh, he confessed that he took part in the brain tree robbery where the two men were killed. And he said that Sacco and Vanzetti were, Sacco and or Vanzetti were not there. Uh, 
Medeiros later said that he knew that they were uh, not only not guilty, but innocent of this crime. He felt sorry for the kids visiting their father. Uh, Medeiros told Thompson that he, Medeiros, was with four Italian professional gangsters who'd robbed freight cars in Providence. Uh, the scenario that police had assumed from the beginning here. Thompson could not use Medeiros's confession until his case ended. Now, in 1926, the Supreme Judicial Court considered only questions of law. In a 90-page decision, they found no error in the conduct of the trial. Massachusetts Rule of Criminal Procedure 30B now allows for a new trial at any time if it appears that justice may not have been done. Uh, loose catch-all possibility. That possibility, that change in the law came too late to assist Sacco and Vanzetti. And then in 1926, the Supreme Judicial Court reversed Medeiros' murder conviction, the murder of the teller in Rentham. He was retried, he was convicted. Thompson then sought another new trial based mostly on Medeiros' confession and his startling argument that the DA had made a deal with the Department of Justice to learn more about anarchists and to get rid of Sacco and Vanzetti. In fact, two former Department of Justice agents swore that the general opinion in the local Department of Justice uh, offices was that the Braintree crime had been committed, quote, by a gang of professional highwaymen. Uh, yes, Sacco and Vanzetti were anarchists. They had nothing to do with it in the view of those DOJ personnel. Uh, two agents said that the DOJ had a considerable amount of documentation regarding this issue. Thompson, despite his best efforts, never obtained it and neither has anyone else. Thayer, once again, denied the motion for a new trial. Uh, Medeiros was a bouncer, a criminal, a killer. Uh, he was not credible, and he might have been promised something for his confession. Denied. This is when, uh, right around this time anyway, it had been building, media backlash and public outrage now exploded. Even the Boston Herald, you all know them, uh, reversed itself. They had previously uh, opined pretty strenuously that Sacco and Vanzetti were guilty. They now called for a new trial. Thompson returned to the SJC yet again with another appeal. And a number of public intellectuals, artists, and writers joined the worldwide protests that had been generated. Uh, future Supreme Court of the United States Justice, then Harvard Law Professor Felix Frankfurter, uh, poet Edda St. Vincent Millay, Albert Einstein, H.G. Wells, and John Dos Passos uh, was pretty heavily involved in this. That pamphlet, by the way, is, I don't know if you can see it, but it's right here. It's in a wrapper and in a plastic. Days after the SJC denied their last motion, that last motion in April of 1927, Thayer formally sentenced Sacco and Vanzetti to die by electrocution. The judges pronouncing the sentence of death customarily say or said, and may the Lord have mercy on your soul. Now Thayer certainly invoked the Lord plenty of times during the trial and at various times during the motions but he didn't say this when he pronounced sentence. Sacco cried out, you condemn two innocent men. Vanzetti had been in uh, Charlestown State Prison all this time. Sacco now joined him from the Dedham facility in, that, uh, in Charlestown, which was antiquated, filthy facility. Uh, this guy had been there since 1920. Really nothing to do with the case. I just love the picture. Now, before the sentence, both men had addressed the court. And Sacco, by this time, had grown 
hopeless. He didn't think there was any way that this system was going to afford them justice. But asked if he had anything to say, Vanzetti, who had been uh, studying in English in prison with the help of some uh, 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 Boston women who were very heavily involved in the defense committee, delivered a lengthy statement, uh, the essence of which was that he was innocent. And if the judge doomed him, in Vanzetti's term, it was solely because Vanzetti had fought what he called the oppression of the man by the man. In other words, that they were anarchists, radicals. Uh, public support for Sacco and Vanzetti were not universal, though it was growing, fueled by this kind of passion. Many petitions were aimed at Governor Alvin Fuller, uh, who had uh, beaten Curley in 1924. They were seeking clemency from Governor Fuller. Uh, Fuller was a self-made millionaire. He owned one of the first auto dealerships in, in Massachusetts. And in 1920, he was deemed the owner of the most successful auto dealership in the world. Fuller, in an unusual move, appointed a committee to advise him if the trial of Sacco and Vanzetti had been fair. And that committee was three men, Harvard, uh, Harvard President Abbott Lawrence Lowell, MIT President Samuel Stratton, and retired probate judge Robert Grant. Uh, dozens of witnesses testified before them or spoke with them, all of it done ex parte, Defense was not present. Uh, they even spoke with Vanzetti. Sacco would not talk to them, but Vanzetti did at length. Um, even talked to Governor Fuller. Uh, he thought that this committee, except for Grant, might be impartial. And he did not believe that Governor Fuller, quote, is going to burn us. After reviewing the committee's decision, the governor announced his decision uh, on August 3rd. He believed Sacco and Vanzetti were guilty. He believed they had a fair trial. There was no reason to give them a new trial. This decision sparked demonstrations involving many thousands of people around the world, the United States to Europe, Africa, South America, Asia. August 10th was set as the date of execution. Then it was stayed until August 22nd. That day, Governor Fuller received numerous visitors along with something like a thousand letters and telegrams, all of them urging clemency. At 5 p.m. thereabouts on August 22nd, uh, Charlestown State Prison, a light dinner was served to Sacco and Vanzetti and also to Celestinos Medeiros. Hundreds of police officers surrounded the Charlestown prison. Uh, this is maybe one of the more benign uh, looking assembly of them. Uh, there was a large public throng out there and reportedly among the crowd was Joe Morelli, who was the head of the Morelli gang from Providence. can see uh, what might be a resemblance between Morelli and Sacco. At 8.45 p.m. on the 22nd came word that the last petition for a writ of habeas corpus, that is a, a writ to bring them into a, into a courtroom to examine this issue one more time, uh, denied, was denied. Uh, the warden went to tell that to Medeiros, to Sacco, and to Vanzetti. In a white, well-lit death chamber, uh, there were doctors, corrections officials, uh, one reporter selected by lot. Behind the screen, there were three green slabs. Now, when more than one condemned prisoner is to be or was to be executed in a single session, the one least able to stand up under the ordeal of awaiting goes first. At 12.03 a.m. on the 23rd of August, 
25 year old Medeiros stumbled into this death chamber. He was apparently in, in kind of a stupor. He didn't say anything. 1400 to 1900 volts were administered to him three times. 36 year old Sacco was next. He called out to Vanzetti, goodbye. He sat calmly in the chair until the guards started to uh, adjust the straps and apply the, uh, the electrodes um, to his leg, I think in particular there. And he suddenly bolted upright and cried out, Viva l'anarchia, long live anarchy. Everything was uh, ready then except for the placement of a mask uh, over Sacco's face. They couldn't find it. A frantic search to find the mask. Sacco cried in broken English, farewell, my wife and child and all my friends. Uh, by then, actually, Sacco had two children. Uh, his daughter, Inez, had been born soon after he was incarcerated. Uh, then to the witnesses, Sacco said politely, good evening, gentlemen. The mask was located. It had been caught in Medeiros' clothing, now returned to the death chamber and placed on Sacco. He addressed his dead mother, farewell, mia madre. Then, and quote, extra heavy current of 1800 to 2000 volts. Why the heavy current? Sacco had been on a hunger strike. His body lacked salts and water, uh, which conduct electricity. And then Vanzetti, now 39 years old, uh, shook hands with his guards, thanked the warden, who by this time was in tears, and he walked the 20 steps to the death chamber. Uh, being strapped into the chair, Vanzetti calmly addressed the witnesses. I wish to tell you I am innocent and never committed any crime, but sometimes some sin. I thank you for everything you have done for me. I am innocent of all crime, not only of this, but all. I am an innocent man. Then he said, I wish to forgive some people for what they are now doing to me. Then 1400 to 1800 volts. Uh, Sacco and Vanzetti. Sacco, hardworking family man, loved his vegetable garden, uh, which his boss at his factory had uh, allowed him to cultivate. And he often gave vegetables away to uh, people who needed them. Uh, and Vanzetti, who was essentially a self-taught intellectual. He was loved in his humble community of North Plymouth. Nice guys, but they were committed anarchists and they were not adverse to at least the notion that bombing to advance their cause was justified. Although no evidence has ever been linked to them as to any such terrorist acts. Uh, were they innocent of shooting Parmenter and Birardelli? Probably. Were they proven guilty of those murders, that robbery, beyond a reasonable doubt? No. Uh, by the way, none of the stolen money was ever found. Certainly none was ever linked to Sacco or Vanzetti, or indeed to any anarchist or anarchist organization, which I know sounds kind of like an oxymoron. And uh, stealing payroll money belonging to shoe factory workers, which Sacco was, uh, seems kind of uh, uh, illogical because they had consistently championed such workers in their way. They have never been pardoned. Uh, to do so would involve acknowledging their guilt. But in the on the 50th anniversary of their executions in 1977, Governor Michael Dukakis issued a proclamation that any disgrace should be forever removed from their names. Uh, and 20 years later in 1997, the Commonwealth finally accepted a cast of a memorial plaque uh, to Sacco and Vanzetti, which had been designed by the sculptor of Mount Rushmore, Goodson Borglum that he had created 60 years earlier. 
Uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, after their execution, lay in open caskets at Joseph Langoni's on Hanover Street in the North End for three days in a candlelit room. 100,000 people viewed them. And on the rainy day of their funeral, 200,000 people. The hearses drove side by side eight miles to the cemetery. And there they were cremated. And then they really were together. Their ashes were commingled. Some of those ashes probably went to Rosina. Uh, some probably went to the Sacco Vanzetti Defense Committee and may have ended up in the Boston Public Library. But as to the bulk of the ashes, Vanzetti's sister, who had come to the country for this last part of the ordeal, took two urns to Italy, uh, one to each of two villages, 540 miles apart. And that is it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Gregory. A wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, we went a few minutes over, but that is, uh, as expected, that is fine. Uh, so let's take five to 10 minutes of questions, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, let's see here. Ron says, I wrote a term paper about Sacco and Vanzetti about 60 years ago for a oh, freshman for English class. Your presentation brought back many memories. Very well done. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike asks, why were so many people rejected from the jury? Oh, because they, pro uh, they probably uh, had uh, either previously expressed, although that didn't stop the foreman from getting on there, opinions about Sacco and Vanzetti, or probably evidenced uh, antipathy toward radicals, reds, socialists, communists. Hard to say. Um, but I can tell you that uh, Webster Thayer, Judge Webster Thayer, made a real point of saying to the jury before the jury selection process began that I'm not gonna let you out of here because it's inconvenient to you. That's when that sort of soldier analogy arose. Um, it, it's gonna take something much, much more than that for you not to get on here. And, pre, and obviously a lot of people uh, had it. Uh, you would maybe be surprised to learn what people are willing to say uh, to get out of jury service once they're in the courtroom. Um, some things that aren't very uh, complimentary to themselves or their character. Uh, Barbara says, wow, very moving presentation. DL says that uh, your presentation was told as vividly as a movie. Uh, very well done. Uh, Harriet asks, are their family members still alive? Uh, as far as I can tell, the last direct family member uh, was to, to be around was Sacco's daughter, Inez. She died in 2014 and she was in her nineties. I want to say 92 or so. She's the last one that I know of, of a direct lineal descendant. It doesn't mean there aren't any, uh, but uh, that's pretty recent. I mean, this is not really ancient history in more than one way. Uh so Richard said, we have, I want to get to three more questions here, uh, Gregory. Richard sure. says, uh, this case is often cited as the first use of a comparison microscope to match bullets. Uh, Colonel Goddard uh, was pretty convinced that the bullets matched. Does that mean that the gun or evidence was planted? That's been the theory that's ra been raised by uh, several writers since that the evidence might have uh, been planted. The the ballistics evidence itself is a, that's a whole day seminar. There were, there were experts all over the place. Um, and another one of the controversial things I might say is that about the ballistic evidence is that I believe that that four, four person there, the previous police chief of Quincy brought in some bullets for the jury to look at because what they had obviously were just shells, but he brought some in and they kind of compared those and some of the uh, uh, shells that were in evidence. So that's obviously improper. Um, and I think they even might have opened up. Uh, in fact, I know they did. They, they had the shotgun shells in there that they had taken from Vanzetti uh, and they opened those up to see what kind of shot was inside of them. That is probably 
<laughs> not good and improper, but uh, there's no definitive answer, especially on the ballistics evidence as to uh, whether or not the gun that uh, Sacco had was the one that ended up murdering Burardelli, which was the point on that evidence. Uh, Gerard asks, uh, was Thayer involved in any other controversies? Other than his house being blown up a few years later? Uh, I don't think so. Not that I'm aware of anyway. Um, he died in the 1930s, I'm going to say mid-30s. I think I had it up there, 35, 37, mm -hmm. somewhere. I'm unaware of any other controversies involving Thayer. And uh, we'll end... End... Oh, go ahead, Gregory. I was just going to say there might be some. I'm unaware of them, and they certainly have not been highlighted in the literature that I've reviewed. Uh, Eileen says, stunning presentation. I was Thank absolutely you. captivated. The story of Sacco and Vanzetti was well known in my Italian immigrant household. I only wish my mother had lived long enough to hear this presentation. And uh, final word, final question goes to Mike, who asks, how did the rules of evidence and other behaviors compare with the current norms of the day? Uh, well, now there's sort of a codified uh, rules of evidence that's used in, 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 uh, in, in trials. Uh, but I think I mentioned, or I know I mentioned, the most important one would be the rule of criminal procedure that would allow for the, for the uh, new trial motions to be allowed. And probably to deny them would be improper. And the one I refer to is uh, the rule now has a catch-all phrase in it. Back then, your, your, your road to success in the, in the SJC Supreme Judicial Court was pretty narrow. They looked at legal issues only. They reviewed the record. Nothing in the record struck them as being improper or at least improper enough to afford Sacco and Vanzetti a new trial. Now, I think, given that open-ended, uh, that justice might not have been done, uh, I would think that they would get a new trial. So that is the most important difference between now and 1921, I would say. All right, Gregory, I lied. A couple more comments and questions <laughs> in the chat. Um, Teresa says, excellent presentation. Thank you. Sally Teresa. says, both fascinating and tragic. Thank you for a wonderfully detailed and informative uh, presentation. Uh, let's combine these two questions. Paul asks, how long did the jury deliberate? And DL asks, were there any comments from jurors as to why they voted for conviction? Uh, well, we know why the foreman <laughs> voted for conviction. Uh, I that's, those are good questions that I don't really know the answer to. I, I'm not sure. I want to say that they got uh, they got the verdict inside of one day, but it's kind of flitted away from my mind at the moment. Um, it, it's not like the Lizzie Borden jury who came back inside of an hour. And for most of the hour, they were sitting around drinking water and praying. But uh, I'm unclear on that. And now I'm going to find out. Hey, we stumped him, everyone. All right. Yeah, you stumped me happen. right at the end. I know, so right? You ask, you were, don't ask the last question, Rob. That's right. You were bit. You were batting a thousand. And then look what happens. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to settle for nine hundred. Um, okay, so, uh, Gregory, did you have any last words uh, while we wrap up here? I just wanted to thank everybody for tuning in this morning. I know, uh, you know, sunny day and all that. Um, so thank you for tuning in. And I especially was moved, I have to say, by some of the very, very kind comments that uh, Robert related to me just now. Very, very gratifying. And I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Gregory. I'm sure we'll uh, see you again uh, down the road. Sounds uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. I want to thank the uh, Friends of the Tewksbury Library for being the primary sponsor. Also want to thank the libraries in Rockport and Medford. Uh, for partnering with us and helping us promote this program. Uh, look for an email from me later today with a link to a feedback survey and a link to this recording. Uh, so that should be coming at you before five o'clock. So thank you all so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again, Gregory. So do I. And thank you. Yeah. Bye all.